Roman is the biggest bad guy character in professional wrestling. Rev, when's the last time you got laid? Uh, French toast is the exchange student that you have like a three week affair with. Hey, we can see that you don't have pants on. Can we tell the truth about Dusty sooner or later? Uh, well, like, less less people wanted that than are currently watching our show. <laughs> 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 You know Vince, and you still think, hmm, are these true? It's like, welcome to the Mark It Down podcast. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mark It Down podcast. I'm James Giassanti, and I could not be more excited than I am right now. We've had a lot of fun on the podcast. We've interviewed some special names, but truly, I don't think I've ever marked out more than I'm about to. Or how I did when I said hello to this guest, as we're about to share the screen with the one, the only, Alex Shelley. Everybody. Alex, thank you so much for being here today. We truly appreciate it. When I tell you the level of mark that I am for you right now, can't. It can't be expressed in words. I don't want to blow out your eardrums, but there would be a lot of chanting otherwise. But um, Alex, first of all, you have had such a legendary career, both as a singles wrestler and as a tag team wrestler. You've spent time in every major promotion there is today, from TNA to Ring of Honor to AEW to New Japan to a one-off appearance in NXT for WWE. Few people have had such a renowned resume. Was it a goal of yours to be so universally experienced and traveled? And are there places you'd still like to visit? Uh, yeah, it was. As far as being globally seasoned, for lack of a better term, when I was coming up in the early aughts, uh, wrestlers my size were considered quite small as opposed to more average sized. And I think as we've seen society and certainly sports get smaller over the years, uh, certainly with people like Conor McGregor, you see some of these running backs and tight ends in the NFL who are, you know, under 200 pounds by like many, many kilos. Uh, it, it, it's definitely been a reduction in terms of scale as far as like how big athletes used to be. And that being stated, um, I looked up to many of the wrestlers who had traveled the world and had learned all these different styles of wrestling. Um, I was a kid who grew up on WWF and the smaller guys there who are still over six feet tall, but your Owen Hart's, your Sean Waltman's, Sean Michaels, and then eventually the WCW cruiserweights left a huge impression on everybody in my generation. Um, Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Jericho, uh, Lance Storm, so on and so forth. Yeah. And these are guys who had to master their craft in different parts of the globe, uh, whether that was Europe or Japan or Mexico, Canada, the UK, they went everywhere. And I think as a younger wrestler, if you're able to do that, you should. So as a message to everybody out there who's at the onset of their career, if you get the opportunity to go to WXW for a few months, do that. If you get an opportunity to start traveling to Tijuana for Lucha Libre shows and do that. Um, any dojo in Japan that you can stay in for a prolonged period of time is going to be the best wrestling school you could ever really attend. And it evens you out as a person, but certainly as a wrestler too. Love that. I love that. Absolutely. Uh, the more well-traveled, I think the more we learn, like you said. Um, so moving into uh, one particular company that you're very well attached to, TNA, uh, you are the third longest reigning TNA world champion in the company's history, uh, in, slash impact world champion in the company's history. Uh, was there a sense of validation that came with the length of the reign? And was there any moment that you were most proud of as champion? And conversely, were there any stories you wish that you were able to tell as champion, but you didn't have the opportunity? It didn't get pointed out to me that my length uh, as champion had been a lot longer than many other champions reigns in the company until probably December. And I lost the belt to Moose in January. Uh, to me though, that is ancillary. I mean, is it better to hold it for a long time or is it better to win it multiple times or uh, however you slice that? Um, 
doesn't really change how you do the job, in my opinion. So just to be able to ascend to that point in a company full of very, very talented wrestlers, obviously we've seen these metamorphoses over the years from TNA to Impact, six-sided ring, four-sided ring, this person's in charge, that person's in charge. The fact of the matter is when I became champion, it was in a company full of people who were really, really good and worked really, really hard. And that's what I'm most proud of. Uh, as far as moments that stick out, for me, the one that was very, very special as far as being heartrending was wrestling Tanasan, Tanahashi, mm. uh, W Arena, no less. But that's a guy who mentored me in Japan and took care of me for years. And somebody that I emulated, and really we emulated a lot of the same wrestlers. Um, but I looked up to him so much. And to be able to stand across the ring from him as an equal, that, that was pretty special, especially considering how rare those instances would be because I don't work for New Japan Pro Wrestling full-time. Um, I would say that I think a lot of the opportunities I was given to speak on the microphone surprised a lot of people. Mm. And I'm somebody who always feels pretty comfortable as far as their verbiage goes, as far as speaking to other humans. And I think people forgot I could do that. I think mm. people forgot that I can show a little bit of an attitude and have a little bit of chip on my shoulder and have these multi-dimensional facets to a character that really make the character more dynamic. And that's, to me, again, somebody who grew up watching the WWF, you had all these shades of gray with all these characters. Um, Nobody was really true, truly good or bad, right? Like it was more so situated mm -hmm. as far as uh, where you would view their motives. And I thought that was important. So specifically those instances against Josh Alexander, I think were quite a bit of fun for me. No, absolutely. And that actually leads me to another point that I, I wanted to make and a question I was going to ask that um, when whether you're portraying yourself as a baby face or as a heel, you found a way, in my opinion, to keep your character remarkably consistent. Uh, it, you more or less kind of answered that, whether or not that was an, a special attention to detail that you played, but was that something you wanted to portray as a champion? Because no matter what, and again, this is coming from a, a giant fan of yours, so apo I apologize for kissing your butt. I feel you managed to have the fans on your side, no matter who you were wrestling. Yeah. And it's, again, as I mentioned, very much shades of gray and yeah. you watch how I wrestle and whether or not I'm a quote unquote, good guy or bad guy. I wrestle the same way, more or less. Yeah. And again, I think it's the situation at hand. We have these words in the English language, uh, that identify emotions. They identify mm. whether you're angry or frustrated or pissed off or sad. Uh, at the same time, I feel like we shortchange ourselves by labeling them because mm. it's a spectrum, right? Like there's a mm. broad range of being pissed off, but you can be pissed off and not necessarily angry too. Mm. And I think being able to toe the line between these things and really, uh, I'm not an actor, but I imagine that a method actor takes much more intense but similar approaches to where they put themselves in that place. So you really have to like visualize and detach from your situation or how you feel about it and really try and wrap your head around the matter at hand. And obviously the stories in pro wrestling are what make it pro wrestling. So you have to do your best with that. Absolutely. Uh, now, to pivot again just a little bit, uh, you have an undeniably successful singles career, uh, but your name will always likely be linked to uh, the celebration of tag team wrestling. Whether it was groups like Generation Next or Paparazzi Productions or tag teams like the Time Splitters and of course the Motor City Machine Guns, uh, are you equally as proud of your tag team wrestling as you are your singles career? And in 2024, how do you view the tag team wrestling landscape? You know, I was asked that question by Bully Ray not that long ago. Mm. And I feel like to tackle the landscape of tag team wrestling first, um, I feel like we're in a bit of a down period. And I say this as somebody who competed for the third largest company in North America and has friends in the other companies as well, but also somebody who 
uh, does quite a few independent shows and I love independent pro wrestling and there just aren't that many true tag teams out there. And I felt like maybe 10 years ago, there were quite a few. Uh, again, I think there's going to be waves of this. I think it will undulate. It can't consistently just be great tag teams always. You know, that's not how this works. Um, at the same time, the more emphasis that is put on tag team wrestling by major companies, typically the more you will see these tag teams come up and grow. Um, AEW obviously has many, many tag teams. Um, WWE, not as many established ones. TNA tends to flex both ways. Um, mm. They'll have these awesome tag teams for a little while and due to the nature of the company, um, they might only be around for a short period of time. Uh, so I think there's probably going to be a trend of more tag teams coming around because it is something that's still pretty heavily emphasized by all the major companies. Um, at the same time, too, I think there's more tag teams out there to mentor the younger teams. And ultimately, that's what's so important about keeping that art form alive, because it is an art form. And you have teams in AEW like FTR and the Young Bucks. And we're not in TNA anymore, but the Rascals are, who are kind of our direct protégés. And um, you have uh, these teams that are starting to burge in, in WWE as well. Um, there are a handful of teams on the independents. Nick Wayne and Jordan Oliver were just such an exceptional team when they were together. Um, Judas Icarus and Travis Williams are just so good. Um, you know, the Bullet Club's War Dogs, uh, West Coast Wrecking Crew, like these are really, really, really good teams who can be picked up at any time. Mm. As far as my personal legacy goes with tag team wrestling, I never planned on being a tag team wrestler. Uh, when I grew up, tag teams were two guys who kind of looked basically the same. That's kind of how tag team wrestling was like for mm -hmm. the long. And when the Motor City Machine Guns came around, I felt like we were one of the first teams to switch that up a little bit. Um, and obviously other teams followed suit. Uh, and we just had so many great opponents and time splitters did too. Uh, and I was just so lucky to have both Saban and Kushi as partners, like lightning doesn't strike twice, but it did. And we wouldn't have been nearly as good if we didn't have, first of all, the mentors to learn from. Uh, we were able to learn from Billy Gunn and Road Dog. We were able to learn from Team 3D. I was able to learn from Nash directly. I was able to learn from Sean Waltman directly. Um, but then we had just such amazing dance partners like Beer Money and the British Invasion and uh, obviously the Bucks. Uh, the Bucks I've wrestled more than anybody else. I've shared a ring more with Nick and Matt than anybody in my career, just because it happened for so long in TNA and it happened for so long in new Japan. And then it happened for so long again, in ring of honor. <laughs> and, it, you know, just some of the younger teams we've been able to work with in TNA the past couple of years too, uh, Ace and Bay and the rascals who I mentioned again, and subculture who are just so goddamn good. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what it takes is it takes like a multitude of teams to really create that interest and dynamic sort of tag team match that you're looking for. No, I, I completely agree. I, I grew up loving tag team wrestling. I grew up during uh, the early boom of, you know, we had the edge and Christians, the, the Hardys, the Dudleys. So I've always had a special place in my heart for it. And to see, like you said, the ebbs and flows of how tag team wrestling is treated. I, I, I loved being able to see, again, I'm marking out, sorry, uh, the Motor City Machine Guns multiple times in person. You guys just have such a dynamic and such a, I, what I loved about specifically with your team, and you touched on it a little bit, is that you didn't, not, not only did you guys not just look the same, you had your own distinctive looks. You felt like individuals who found a way to be a, a perfect team while maintaining who you are as characters. And I don't think you see that a lot in tag team wrestling today. So, yeah, I would, I would agree. And we are fortunate enough to like be similar size and have very similar athletic abilities. And that's a reason that time splitters work so well too. Yes. To be honest with you is like we had the same timing we had the same thought processes for the most part um but again like that's really what made that style where it's kind of a rat-a-tat-tat -tat, strike them four times before they can hit you once um really work and stand out and, and i wouldn't have been able to do it with anybody else i don't think i don't think it would have been possible so there's no future tag team partner you're looking for at this point 
<laughs> no, but I mean, there's so many guys out there who I, I can say like, man, if, if gun to my head, like Kushi and Josh aren't available, save it being Josh, then who would be my tag team partner? And, you know, there, there are like a handful of people who would be able to slot in and do really, really well with me. There was a point pre pandemic actually, where I was going to start doing tag matches on independence with Lee Moriarty. And uh, I think that would have been so cool. Cause he was kind of one of the first guys I mentored when I came back and he's done so well, but he's just such an incredible thinker. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if I had to pick, like, a third machine gun, man, it's like, I, I really think, like, Trey Miguel would have slotted well or Zach would have slotted well there, too. And then I see Kushi do things with Jet, right? Mm. And, like, what they do is the Jet Setters in New Japan is really, really cool. And I, I think that speaks volumes to Kushi for being able to modulate his role because he's basically where like Liger was many years ago, as far as being like the veteran, the yeah. most heavyweight there now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to pivot once again to a completely different facet of your career and something uh, involved with wrestling, but slightly outside of it. Uh, back in 2018, you entered the world of physical therapy. Has your new medical knowledge influenced your style of wrestling or either how you prepare beforehand or recover afterwards? Oh, man, that is such a loaded question. And, you know, that is such a passion of mine, being a movement professional, um, not just in the PT realm, but, um, you know, having a nutrition certification and being a strength and conditioning coach. Um, yeah, is the short answer. Like, <laughs> Yes. Oh my God. Yes. And I think probably the greatest way it's influenced me is I've just learned so much. Right. And, and there's constantly new information coming out because really, truly, as far as these types of things go, the research is, uh, I don't want to say antiquated, but it's getting more and more researched every year. So really like the past like 20 years, you've seen this massive uptick kind of debunking a lot of theories that we thought to be true. Mm. Uh, I'll try and give this to you very quickly, but it hasn't necessarily changed the way I wrestle more. So my styles change because I've observed what's being done and what's in vogue in wrestling. Mm -hmm. And I always believe in if everybody's going left, then you have to go right. You have to do something different. Being different is typically like 99 times out of a hundred, a good thing in pro wrestling. And there's trends. There's always going to be trends, but you see a lot of the same, whether that's people's aesthetic or whether that's people's wrestling technique or certain things they do um, in the ring. So I try and veer away from that as far as what I actually mechanically do. Now, in terms of the biophysical, the recovery and the preparation, uh, I learn more about that every year. And every year I think to myself, oh, my God, I know nothing. Um, <laughs> but. I'm constantly changing that and it has lended itself to longevity. If nothing else, it's lended itself to longevity. I, if I've gotten injured in the past year and I've been able to work through that because I know how to treat these injuries. Uh, I know how to dial up my training, dial down my training. Um, I, I understand what a red flag would look like as far as like, this is like a real problem versus this is something I can work through. And then if it is something I can work through, well, how do you tackle that? Like, how do you grade down your training to titrate it back up? Because you can't just continue training the same way outside the ring. And really that's where like the hardiness of a pro wrestler, that's where a lot of their longevity comes from. You watch an eight, 10 minute match, maybe a 20 minute match. And okay, you see that snapshot of it, but what happens the other, you know, six days out of the week is really mm -hmm. what's important in terms of keeping them going. And that's why you see some of these guys um, with different schedules in pro wrestling do really, really well. And as a general rule, I think athletes are getting better for longer. You look mm -hmm. at other sports and it's not abnormal to see people playing at a very, very high level into their 40s. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, certainly not the case. So mm -hmm. short answer, yes, it's changed everything. But you got the details, too. Thank you for the details. 
Um, now, I don't want to keep you much longer. We appreciate your time so much here. But just to end uh, to end on, uh, you just spoke about longevity and the longevity of your career. And with a career that spans over 20 years, at this point, do you find yourself looking back or are you still hungry and looking forward for more? Uh, looking forward, for sure. Because I've never been somebody who, you know, everybody's got different motives. Mm-hmm at different points in their life. And that changes completely. Right. Um, as it should. Uh, but I think I'm somebody who, this was pointed out by a really good friend of mine produces very well when their back is against the wall. And I'm not a millionaire. I'm not a mega, mega superstar. Uh, at the same time, I've done a lot of things that were you to list them and see them itemized like, wow, this is pretty cool. And I feel like if I don't have something to pursue, if I don't have a sense of purpose, uh, then I don't do nearly as well. Therefore, uh, I have to look forward. Like looking back retroactively does me no good. I, I like to have something to chase. And I think that's when my production is by far the greatest. You can look at the past couple of years. And I think that's kind of indicative of that because I had to take so much time off um, due to COVID reasons. When I worked in medical, when I came back, I started from the ground up. I started from the independence and worked my way back up, back up, back up. And I think part of that also is the ideology that I view every match as a gift. Like every time I get to do this, this is a gift and it can be taken away at any point in time. And there's people out there who would pay or give anything to be able to just have one pro wrestling match. So keeping that mm, perspective with more of a pragmatic view of, okay, I like the grind and I'm good at grinding keeps me trudging on. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Alex, thank you so much for all the insight and all the knowledge you've shared with us today here at the Market Down Podcast. Uh, it was truly a pleasure to have you, and I look forward to seeing you down the road and uh, being a fan for you of yours for a very long time. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And everybody, this is the Market Down Podcast. I am James Gisanti, joined by Alex Shelley. I hope you guys have a great day, and... Catch you later. As always, watch wrestling.